Mm-hmm. Hello, uh, today is uh, July the 19th, uh, 2023, and we'll talk about two architects. We'll start with uh, Giuseppe Terrani, uh, and um, let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. Giuseppe Terrani, <clears throat> born the 18th of April, but died on the 19th of July, and today is the 19th of July, 1943, so, you know, uh, 80 years ago he died was an Italian architect who worked primarily under the fascist regime of Benito Mussolini and pioneered the Italian modern movement under the rubric of rationalism. His most famous work is the Casa del Fascio, built in Como, northern Italy, which was begun in 1932 and completed in 1936. It was built in accordance with the international style of architecture and frescoed by abstract artist Mario Radice. In 1938, at the behest of Mussolini's Mussolini's fascist government, Terrani designed the Danteum, an unbuilt monument to the Italian poet Dante Alighieri, structured around the formal divisions of his greatest work, the Divine Comedy. This was uh, uh, Terrani Giuseppe, Giuseppe Terrani, a handsome Italian man. Unfortunately, he died young. Uh, again, progettare la cultura. Indeed. Some drawings by Giuseppe Terrani. He was less than 40 when he died. These are, these are drawings for the Danteum, but we are, we are going to see the project in detail at the end of this presentation. Very interesting that Mussolini, in a certain way, or maybe explicitly, maybe directly, he commissioned this, uh, this project. And it would have been great if it was built. This is a, a perspectival drawing of... Uh, Casa del Fascio, the, the house of the fascism, uh, built in Como, which I visited, uh, study for the same project. But uh, it might be that this drawing uh, belongs to someone closer to us, considering the car that is um, thrown there. So it might be that this is not a drawing by, uh, by Giuseppe Terrani. Paciata dei primi due piani. Anyway, uh, I couldn't. I, I, for some reason, I I I, I chose um, text from the the Italian Wikipedia. Maybe there wasn't enough information on the British on the English um, Wikipedia. Uh, this is a uh, some kind of a hotel or a, a hostel. Uh, where is it in Como? He built uh, in Como, so that uh, famous work by him, which we are going to see. He, here he just uh, refurbished the first two floors. Interesting, in a way, those spheres, they, I don't know if they, they belong to him, so to speak. Novo, novo Comun, Comun, Comun probably Comun, the Como, 1927-1929, that's when Villa Savoie was built, uh, but this is an apartment building. Uh, rather, in a certain way, uh, a little bit dated, but it's still a good building. Giuseppe Terrani. So for me, it's, it's rather interesting that the Italians who are, you know, closer in a way to Dionysus than Apollo, so to speak, uh, temperamental, uh, uh, emotional, yet rationalism was a, a strong uh, movement in architecture, Italian architecture. So you wonder. You know, maybe because opposites attract, 
Giuseppe, Terra, Giuseppe Terani. Monumento ai caduti della guerra mondiale di Erba. I don't know Italian, so I apologize. 1926-1932. Uh, this uh, a little bit different from, you know, his, I mean, maybe a, more than a little bit different from the rationalist uh, uh, architecture that he is known for. Also, probably also because of the material, construction material that he used, in this case, stone. And uh, it, is, uh, it is indeed a monument. We cannot call it any other way. Giuseppe Terran. And the stair is, uh, is for those who can afford to uh, climb it. I don't know what they commemorate it here or commemorate. Uh, he built another one, a very impressive one, a smaller one. Uh, we are going to see it. And one was built uh, uh, in the name of uh, Antonio Santelia. Giuseppe Terani, he built it for uh, Santelia. Santelia died at 28. And later, some intellectuals uh, and artists uh, united their forces and were able to build um, a monument which uh, Antonio Santelia only uh, sketched or drew in a brilliant drawing. Monument ai caduti di Como, 1931. This is the, this is the work that was anticipated for, or, uh, uh, you know, envisioned by uh, Santelia, but it was built by Terani and a few other people. Monumento ai caduti di Como, 1931-1932. Uh, uh, again, based on a drawing by Antonio Santelia, and we are, we are going to see the drawing. It's, it's a good work, uh, and uh, he, he didn't betray Santelia. It is built, it was built, uh, um, you know, accurately based on the, uh, the drawing by, by Santelia. I hope I have it here in this presentation. It moves me, this collaboration over the years, you know, um, this uh, unity between artists. Um, it's a good thing when this happens, I think. An homage, it was an homage, not just to the fallen uh, soldiers, but also an homage to Antonio Santelia, who died young. You see, Santelia Marinetti, that is the futurist uh, uh, poet, Prampolini, Attilo e Giuseppe Terani, uniti dal monumento ai caduti, united by this monument, which, you know, uh, was built by, by these people collaborating over time. Santelia was already dead when the other four people, uh, you know, united forces to have it built. And you have here in the, on the left side, the drawing by Antonio Santelia, a typical, so to speak, drawing by Antonio Santelia. And you can see the, the, the similarity between the build structure and the drawing by Santelia. They, they respected his vision and it's a good thing that they did. That's the drawing by Antonio Santelia. Who died, as I said, at 28, unfortunately. a so-called visionary drawing. And now the built work with an interesting uh, presence there, the white horse. Now here maybe there was a strike of some sort. Italians uh, la like to strike from time to time. Maybe we need more monuments in the world, but 
but not monuments, you know, to celebrate, um, you know, uh, generals and political figures, but cultural achievements, I would say. But, and also, of course, the sacrifices of those who died, either defending the country or for, 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 a, for a legitimate reason. Or maybe even monuments to, you know, uh, maybe even some unknown spiritual forces, like um, the not yet born certain gods. But maybe the word monument is not the best because it is a little bit uh, emphatic and it, it risks of becoming even demagogical. Maybe we could invent a different word. The Tomba, Tomba Stekini in Como, 1932, um, he built two in a cemetery, in, I guess, um, I mean in Como, but I don't know if there is just one cemetery there or not. Here we see touches of, um, you know, a, a classical or classicist disposition. Um, it is, it is indeed, it belongs to, you know, to, to a cemetery. Giuseppe Terani. And on the right, we see the, the other one done by him. So he, he built both. He was a very good architect. And, uh, you know, the fact that Peter Eisenman, I've heard him, you know, he, he had a collection of books or maybe even drawings or something, you know, he was a, a great fan of uh, Giuseppe Terani, Peter Eisenman. Now he's a great fan of Alberti, but maybe he remained um, close to the avant-garde uh, that Giuseppe Terani, um, you know, was part of. Sala o, o della Mostra della Rivoluzione Fascista a Roma, 1932. Uh, and uh, here he did, uh, you know, it's a stage design inside the building, inside that, um, that, that room, that large room within this, um, uh, I don't know what it is, um, a complex of buildings or one building that celebrated the, uh, the fascist revolution in um, Palazzi di, del Littorio. And you see the interior is, um, uh, I wouldn't call it rationalist at all. It's, it's rather futurist. It's dynamic, lots of diagonals. Uh, it's, uh, it's um, you know, uh, dramatic. It, it's so interesting that, uh, you know, Mussolini and Hitler had different visions of architecture, they, they both had a great interest in architecture, but in a different kind of architecture. Mussolini uh, seemed to be open towards some kind of a modern architecture, while Hitler uh, was closer to, you know, uh, diminishing the modern spirit in the buildings that he promoted or encouraged through the works of uh, Albert Speer and, and others, perhaps. This kind of work, I don't think Hitler would have accepted. But it seems Mussolini was uh, in the field of uh, aesthetics. Uh, he was um, you know, rather open-minded. I read that actually Mussolini in his early years, when he was a young man, he was, um, uh, was a communist. And then he became a fascist. But the Italian fascism, I think, was different from the German one. Anyway, the, the work done by Giuseppe Terani shows uh, his versatility. This work is very different from uh, what is called Italian rationalism. Maybe not so much the poster, I mean, no. Sorry, what I meant is that the poster is indeed uh, emphatic enough about being, uh, you know, fascist. 
mostra della rivoluzione fascista. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to upload those uh, the expressions of the, on those faces. But it's strange, you know, the way very sensitive uh, artists who sympathized with fascism, and not just with uh, the Italian fascists, but also with the German one, like Emil Nolde. But what about uh, the philosopher, uh, uh, you know, the great German philosopher Martin Heidegger? Uh, what about uh, the great Norwegian writer Knut Hamsun? who even wrote, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, an admiring letter to Hitler. And he received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And then later on, the Norwegians kind of, uh, you know, uh, placed him in the shadow because of his pro-Hitler uh, uh, positioning. And uh, yes, then there is Philip Johnson who sympathized with the, with the passes. So how do you explain it? That there were, you know, capable people, talented people, sensitive people, sympathizing with the, uh, <laughs> sympathizing if we call these faces, you know, sympathetic faces with the, you know, stern um, facial expressions. And look here, order, order, of course, the army. How come the, the sensitive artists, including Giuseppe Terani, were not uh, turned off, so to speak, by, um, you know, having anything to do with the military? This I don't quite understand. Maybe some kind of a, a blindness comes upon um, human beings at certain times in history when we simply do not, do not understand or do not see things properly. Well, but the, the, the building itself is actually you know, kind of interesting with those two uh, huge letters uh, X and then the Mostra, you know, the, the building is... Um, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, narrative. It, 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 it tells the story of a building which is not ideologically indifferent, which is um, looking backwards on, on fascism. It's, of course, not uh, something to be cheerful about. But the building still has uh, expression, you know, architectural expression. It's not, it's not a building that leaves you indifferent. You know, the typical World's Fair uh, pavilion, devoid of any kind of uh, uh, leaning uh, was, um, I don't know what kind of uh, ideology. And you look, look at the buildings on the left and uh, in the background, uh, you look at the car, look how people are dressed, and then you look at the building. And the building has a, a striking modernity compared to everything that um, I mentioned uh, before. Giuseppe Terani, Albergo Posta, Como, a postal office. No, no, sorry, it's uh, it's it's an uh, um, albergo, some kind of a hostel or hotel. Uh, you see his name there, 1929, 1931. Uh, in, again in Como, Giuseppe Terani, and I don't know exactly what he did here. He refurbished an existing building already. Uh, inside, you know, the, the, the parapet, the handrail uh, of the stair is... Uh, no, moderately modern. Progetto per un villa con Darsena, 1932. Uh, it would be interesting to actually compare this building. Maybe there are some echoes coming from Le Corbusier, but the building is still uh, uh, different. Unfortunately, I only have these plans. Uh, it was just a project. It was not built, but uh, 
the plants are, I think, uh, worthy, worthy of our attention, of study. Giuseppe Terran. Tomba Pirovano, Como, 1936. Uh, yeah, it is him with the respect that death deserves. We saw it already in the first picture with the other um, you know, tomb on the left side, and now we look at the building on the right. Casa del Fascio, his most famous work in, in Como, 1932-1936. And this one, yes, is a splendidly, uh, you know, Apollonian, uh, white, uh, controlled by reason, by the greed. Uh, you can imagine at that, that time it was, was uh, you know, uh, a statement, uh, an aesthetical statement uh, that uh, proclaimed uh, what, what we call today uh, rationalism. There are some great trees. Um, I don't have pictures with them. In fact, I, I like more the trees in front of this building than the building. I like the building too, and I, I'm, I'm interested in Giuseppe Terrani, but um, there were some, some very dramatic trees, very sculptural, I remember, in front, of, in front of this building. I don't know what kind of institution is there now. Inside there are art shows or writing, art installations. Even the, the, the parapet is, uh, you know, rather creative. And you look at the, the architectural language of the church and you look at the architectural language of the building by Giuseppe Tarani and they are, you know, centuries apart. The building is not ideologically heavy. It's not, although we see in this picture, you know, soldiers there, but the building has a modernity which transcends the limitations and the heaviness of ideology. Could we, uh, you know, uh, risk of, uh, of uh, formulating something like, could we call this some kind of, a, you know, soft passes? I mean, could there be something like this, a soft passes? But the architecture is, uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's not, uh, it's not uh, oppressive, at least in this building, which is the, the house of passes, in Como, it's a building which could have been anything, even the house of democracy or the house of peace. Easily you could call this building the house of peace. Well, a rather, you know, grid-like or rectangular peace, but still peace. Instead, it's the house, was the house of passes. In essence, is that atrium there, you know, with the offices around, 
but it's not uh, dogmatic, it's not strictly symmetrical. It has, um, it, it has a certain, uh, um, you know, open spirit, so to speak. This, this is an architecture analysis, um, you know, done in 2013. Uh, exquisite drawings, but I'm not sure how um, relevant is or uh, evocative even. But it's still a good drawing. And the image is from the inside. Casa del Fascio, Giuseppe Terani. Well, I, I searched for the correct pronunciation of the name on that website called How to Pronounce Correctly, and I couldn't find Giuseppe Terani, but Terani Giuseppe. And if I remember correctly, the pronunciation was kind of like Terani Giuseppe. But if I place the Giuseppe in front of Terani, I, I have I, some difficulties to pronounce it as it is pronounced first with the family name and then with the first name. Maybe it's my problem. But beyond this, this was a good building and is a good building. And is a building which uh, uh, under normal conditions you wouldn't uh, associate at all, I, I would say, with fascism. So maybe the narrative architecture uh, relating uh, a building to, um, you know, a certain ideology is approximate and uh, there is a good chance to be inaccurate. The, the slight asymmetry, uh, I think, uh, adds some ambiguity, so the statement is not uh, is not um, you know uh, easily identifiable in connection with uh, with fascism or with any other kind of ideology. Casa Rustici, a Milano, in collaboration with Pietro Lingeri, 1933-1935. Now, I don't know, does Rustici connect with the rusticity or the rustic, but the building <clears throat> has nothing to do with what the, the word rustic might mean. What's very interesting here is that there are two uh, wings of this building and connected by these uh, long uh, balconies on one side. It's uh, interesting. I hope I have, um, yeah, like, like here you see, essentially there are two parallel buildings that connect in the, in the main elevation through these long balconies. Usually in the corner of a street, <clears throat> you emphasize the corner, but here you have, you have the void, uh, the two sides, the two streets that are parallel or meet at the corner are still identifiable and then united in this, you know, rather honest or transparent way through balconies that unite the two sides. And, and not, a, not a common uh, uh, approach to the matter, I would say. But it, it is a, it is an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting uh, architecture. Why? Because it has the two nests, it has the the rift. There are the two sides that are united, but also separated. 
So the, the rift is still present, but so is the attempt to unite them. Most architects probably would have made, uh, you know, uh, a building here like this, you know, to occupy the corner. Uh, but uh, he left it open and he expressed honestly, so to speak, the two sides of the building. Actually, there are two buildings united rather fragile in a fragile way through the through the balcony here. So there is unity and there is separation at the same time. Casa Toninello a Milano, 1933, also with Pietro Lingeri. Here also we have, uh, you know, uh, a two-ness because of the two sides of the building. Another casa. Also with him, Pietro Lingeri, 1933. This one is also interesting in a way that there is a, I hope I have the plan. Yes, you see this uh, facade here is this, um, this angle is less than 180 degrees. And this shows, um, you know, rather subtly, you know, in the reality of the building. And it's the same. Uh, it's the same on the, on both sides. But here the the angle is um, you know smaller than than here. Here, let's say we about one hundred seventy degrees, and maybe here one hundred sixty degrees, or even one hundred fifty. I don't know. But uh, an interesting conception. Uh, it's an apartment building, like. Um, the other works as well that we just saw. We can perceive in this project as well that the aforementioned two-ness, there is a two-ness here, you know, there are two sides that, that are brought together. In this way, in this case and in some other ways in the previous cases. Two stairs, two elevators, and in between them, you know, what you see, uh, an apartment or two, and on the sides, other apartments. Doesn't look striking, you know, but uh, towards the outside. Glass blocks, glass bricks. And lots of stuff in the in the balcony on the you know the, the first floor. Casa Giringelli.
Casa di Vacanze, un lago per l'artista. Uh, this was part of the Milano Triennial in 1933. But I'm a little bit uh, confused here. Um, I don't know if this still exists. Uh, this is the house. And in the language, the architectural language is like uh, what he did in Casa del Fascio in Como. It's just a smaller building. Uh, now we look at something else, and uh, I am confused. You know, this was the building, or this one. Maybe this one is a different work. It looks like a different work, but I don't know if it's still by Giuseppe Terani. And inside, uh, I guess, the pictorial work of the artist that was built for. Monumento a Roberto Sarfati, sul alto piano di Asiago. This I like very much, 1934. Uh, it's a smaller monument, but it's primal, it's, um, it's uh, archaic, it's modern. I mean, it's both archaic and modern. Uh, I think it is, uh, it is an excellent work. And yes, it cannot be cannot be anything else but a monument. Giuseppe Terani. I guess there are some uh, some uh, virtues in uh, building with stone as opposed to sheetrock. You know, it's um, an ele elemental force here that uh, you you cannot uh, mimic with 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 the very 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 thin materials construction materials of the present. This is a telluric building. And those who think that uh, architecture will become non-gravitational should think twice, because it might be that gravity is, is the only certitude that we have. I like this work by Giuseppe Terani very much. Simple as it is. Casa La Belsari a Milano with the same architect, Pietro Vincheri. And here we see the same thing and the same strategy, architectural strategy. Two sides that meet at the corner but they don't hide their duality. So there is the rift, the break in between them. Thus, the two-ness is again present. Yes, you could say it's, it's a rationalist plan. It's rational. It, it makes sense. You know, you have 
a left side, you have a right side, and they meet at the corner, and the corner is not hiding, you know, the, uh, the anatomy of the building. Nineteen thirty four, nineteen thirty five. The war didn't start yet. The deadly Second World War. Of course, we didn't learn anything from the First World War. I wonder what function this room has, which is, uh, you know, uh, situated in a critical point within the building. What could the function of this room be? Casa Rustici Comoli a Milano with the same architect. Here again, we see maybe, maybe Pietro Lingeri was a specialist in uh, architectural tunnels, if I am to call them so. I don't think uh, tunnels accepts, I mean, tunnels accepts a plural. Maybe I'm wrong. Actually, I saw that Peter Eisenman invented this word, and I, 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 I found out that actually it's, a, it's an official word, so to speak. Tunes, T-W-O-N-E-S-S. -S. There is a play here with the balconies as well that unite and separate at the same time. I mean, they unite, but they unite separated entities, architectural entities, or parts of a building. Again, a, a broken monolith, if I am to say so, two sides with a rift in between them. And then the balcony is emerging from that rift. Villa per il Floricoltore Bianchi Arabio, 1935-1937, an interesting uh, uh, building. Uh, maybe some echoes from Frank Lloyd Wright, but it's a, not, sorry, sorry, what am I saying? From uh, Le Corbusier, but, but it's a very different sensibility here. Uh, Le Corbusier would not have designed something like this nor Giuseppe Terrani would have designed the way Le Corbusier designed, but I, I, I do feel some, some echoes perhaps exist coming from Le Corbusier. You know, the pilotis, the on which uh, the, the building rests. And yes, the presence of the cars which, um, you know, generated the, the plan of Villa Savoie as well. 
with a perfect radius in order to comfortably park the car. But uh, you, we can wonder these days if, 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 if the vehicle should have, uh, should have had such a, you know, uh, generative um, uh, attribute. Because Le Corbusier did, uh, did uh, create the, the ground floor of uh, Villa Savoie with an eye on the car. The car was, uh, its majesty, the car was uh, involved in the, in the birth of that house from the very beginning. Sala della monotautica e sala del canotaggio, anyway. Some kind of a sports uh, building, Palazzo Terrani di Lisone, Casa del Pai. The answer, I don't know what I see being mentioned, Casa del Pascio. This is a building, uh, uh, now it's called Palazzo Terrani, but I don't know what it was for. Maybe some kind of a uh, school or a, a, a gymnasium of some sort. Neglect, but they, they reconsidered, so to speak. Monumentality is still present. Ah, it was Casa del Fascio, but at Lisone, not at, uh, in Como. Another Casa del Fascio. Villa Bianca Cebezo. I like here the uh, here he is more um, exuberant than in the previous um, villa that we saw, and you wonder what is this um, you know flying uh, slab here? What is its function? Is it just uh, you know honoring uh, visuality? Is just for the eye, or it has a a meaning, a symbolic meaning, is is the way through which Giuseppe Terani expressed his uh, desire for the for the for the infinite, maybe for the for the unnamed, for what is far away. I don't know. But it does show that capriciousness is present in architecture. That not everything is justifiable in uh, you know uh, objective terms i don't think there is any kind of objective reason why he extended this uh, slab so much beyond the limit of the building Here you could say that you know it protects this ramp, you know, walking up on you know this ramp. But here, it is possible that the superfluous or superfluousness is actually, uh, you know, uh, that part of a building, if we are to talk about buildings that uh, 
brings uh, unicity uh, or uh, brings uh, personality to a building. Exactly what is uh, rather you know, superficial in a way. So maybe John Raskin was correct when he said that uh, the most beautiful things in the world are the most useless. And he gave us an example, the peacock's tail and the lily. Asilo Santelia di Como, 1936-1937, built by Giuseppe Ferrari. Now it's, uh, who knows what there, maybe a school or something. Maybe a kindergarten of some sort, considering the, you know, <laughs> the little colorful houses in the grass. Casa Pedralio in Como, no pictures, Casa d'Appartamenti, Giuliani, Gerio, a Como. Apartment buildings, plenty of them, built right, uh, right uh, at, the, at the start of the deadly war. Casa Giuliani, Ferrani, strange things happening there at the top. Some disequilibrium there. And now we end this uh, presentation on uh, Giuseppe Terani with his project for the Danteum in Rome from 1938. And uh, it's, it was a, an exercise in uh, narrative architecture and I regret it was not built. So the Danteum project, the Danteum is an unbuilt architecture designed by Giuseppe Terani and Pietro Lingheri. Sketches and drawings of the master gives us, give us the unfulfilled dream of Terani for a monument to Dante in which the divine comedy was projected in an architectural scheme. And we see some of the drawings done for this project. Watercolors and the plan is um, mysterious and complex and yet simple with a forest of columns one has to study very carefully these plans and con connect the ar architecture with the meanings of the work by Dante. In that sense, it is, uh, you know, the ultimate narrative architecture. One would say this is a speculative architecture, but I think any architecture that deserves its name does have a, a speculative side. And uh, I kept saying to myself and others that uh, if we bring together two statements, one by a cultural theorist like Johann Huizinghoff, the, the Dutch um, you know, theoretician of culture, and uh, another statement by uh, Alvaralto, we arrive at the conclusion that architecture only when it, it is or aspires towards the metaphysical becomes culture. And if it becomes culture, it becomes architecture. Because Johann Huizinko said that only when culture aspires towards uh, metaphysics, it, it becomes or is culture. And Alvaralto said that architecture belongs to culture, not to civilization. So if a building um, does want to be named 
architecture, it has to belong to culture, not to civilization. But in order to be to, to belong to culture, it needs, according to Johann Huizinko, to aspire towards the metaphysical. So in the absence of metaphysics, it seems a building is not architecture. But here we see clearly a project full of metaphysical content and the narrative that uh, uh, in this case connects the building with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with uh, Dante and his most important work. So I wonder if there, there isn't a great potential here for an architecture, meaning an architecture that belongs to culture and thus an architecture that deserves to be named architecture. I wish I knew more about this, um, this project. I have to study it myself carefully, but the plans in their simplicity and complexity are uh, intriguing enough to, uh, you know, uh, make us want to know more about this. It was not built. It is a pure architecture. It is a pure architecture, but it is complex enough to have its own um, metaphysical vis viscerality, if I am to call it so. What are the meaning of these columns, round columns in the, in the center of the squares that, uh, you know, become smaller and smaller? And of course, here is the golden ratio uh, and uh, the, the, there are things here that are intriguing, which deserves, deserve attention. Because unfortunately, our architecture today is um, so very often devoid of any kind of uh, uh, metaphysical content, unfortunately. And it's a great loss, in my opinion. So maybe we can learn something from Giuseppe Terani and his partner. Transparent columns, what about this? So they are columns for thought. Paradiso. Reflective columns. A reflective forest of columns. It was not built, but for thought, it's still very important. Let's read Dante and let's reflect on the project for Dante by Giuseppe Terani, the Danteon project, Inferno, the chains, fear, slavery. Purgatorio. Paradiso. These are, uh, you know, contemporary uh, uh, visualizations, I believe, and not, they don't belong to the interpretations of the project by uh, Giuseppe Terrain. Thank you. And uh, now we'll talk, we'll have a short talk, and then we'll see afterwards what we do.